Mr. Vice President, Mr. Speaker, colleagues, distinguished guests, and the McCain family. It's an honor to welcome you this morning. We gather to recognize a great loss and celebrate a great life. We celebrate six decades of devotion to the American idea and the cause of human freedom. Generations of Americans will continue to marvel at the man who lies before us. The cocky, handsome naval aviator who barely scraped through school and then fought for freedom in the skies. Who witnessed to our highest values even through terrible torture and who became a generational leader in the United States Senate where our nation airs its great debates. Now, airing our great debates is a gentle way to describe how John approached the work of a senator. I've long joked that his guards at the Hanoi Hilton probably needed group therapy after John was finished with them. Well, let's just say there were times when some of his Senate colleagues were tempted to form a support group of our own. He treated every issue with the intensity the people's business deserved. He would fight tooth and nail for his vision of the common good. Depending on the issue, you knew John would either be your staunchest ally or your most stubborn opponent. At any moment, he might be preparing an eloquent reflection on human liberty or a devastating joke served up with his signature cackle and that John McCain glint in his eye. He had America's fighting spirit, our noble idealism, our solemn patriotism, and our slightly irreverent streak all rolled into one. I will miss a dear friend whose smile reminded us that service is a privilege and whose scars reminded us of the great cost that brave souls pay for our freedom. John felt like family, but of course it is Cindy and Roberta and Joe and Doug, Andy, Sydney, Megan, Jack, Jimmy, and Bridget who could truly call this man their own. On behalf of the Senate and the entire nation, thank you. Thank you for lending him to us longer than we had a right. Thank you for supporting him while he supported us. Half a world away, wearing our nation's uniform, John McCain stood up for every value that this Capitol building represents. Then he brought that same patriotism inside its walls to advocate for our service members, our veterans, and our moral leadership in the world. So it is only right that today, near the end of his long journey, John lies here in this great hall, under this mighty dome, like other American heroes before him. Here, as a restless wave approaches the shores of eternity, we thank God for giving this country John McCain. <clears throat> on behalf of a grateful nation and on behalf of Congress, I want to begin by giving thanks to the McCain family for your many years of service to our country. We share your anguish in losing this great man. Rarely does this glorious rotunda fall silent at this hour. On a day like this, John would usually be bounding this way or that way 
right through here, visitors turning to each other, asking if that's who they think it is. But in this quiet hour, we are left to ponder how his life speaks to us. John McCain deserves to be remembered as he wished to be remembered. A patriot who served his country. A man, yes, of the Senate, but also a man of the House. A Navy man. A family man. A man who made an enormous difference in the lives of countless people. A man of conviction. A man of state. There's a line from his farewell statement that really just grabbed me. Our identities and sense of worth are not circumscribed but enlarged by serving good causes bigger than ourselves. <laughs> That's John McCain. How fitting and how true. What stands out about John McCain is what he stood for. The rich blessings that only freedom can bestow. The sense of purpose that a battle joined can bring. The common humanity that burns in each of our hearts. Hemingway once wrote, the world breaks everyone and afterward many are strong at the broken places. No one, no one was stronger at the broken places than John McCain. The brokenness was his ballast. He never lost the joy that time can dull or the edge that political life so often sands away. I myself, from time to time, found myself on the receiving end of John's distinct brand of candor. <laughs> Happily so. I remember thinking more than once, yeah, he really does talk like a sailor. <laughs> but you see, with John, it was never feigned disagreement. The man didn't feign anything. He just relished the fight. He showed us that in the arena, the honest back and forth, that's where the cause gets bigger. That's where the triumph is all the sweeter. We get stronger at the broken places. Though the highest office eluded him, he attained what is far more enduring, the abiding affection of his fellow citizens and an example for future generations. So I think ahead now. I think ahead to the day when I, like so many, will bring my own children and perhaps their children to that hallowed lawn in Annapolis. I think about that. I think about what I might say to them. This is one of the bravest souls our nation has ever produced. However you choose to do your part, I hope you do it the way he did. With energy and urgency, playing for keeps, never back on your heels, never letting principle yield to expedience, resisting the false allure of the fleeting and battening down the hatches when things get rough, and always, always having a really good story to tell. Today, our nation bows in grief. But here, under the work of Bramidi, and in the gaze of the greats, where soldiers known and unknown have laid before, we have this beautiful thing, the chance to do for this man what he did for us, to stand up, to stand up and to embrace the cause of his life. 
No one of us can fulfill this charge, but all of us sure can try. Because all of this, all of this, it's worth fighting for. God bless John McCain. And God bless the country he so dearly loved. Leader McConnell, Speaker Ryan, Leader Schumer, Leader Pelosi, distinguished members of Congress, members of the Cabinet, members of our armed forces and honored guests, and most of all, to the McCain family, to Cindy, his children, and Mrs. Roberta McCain. It is deeply humbling to stand before you today at the United States Capitol to commemorate the life and service of an American patriot, Senator John McCain. The President asked me to be here on behalf of a grateful nation to pay a debt of honor and respect to a man who served our country throughout his life in uniform and in public office. And it's my great honor to be here. In the long history of our nation, only 30 Americans have lain in state here in the United States Capitol Rotunda. Today, as a reflection of the esteem in which his colleagues and our country hold him. Senator John McCain joins those ranks. The son and the grandson of four-star admirals, John came from a family that prized military service. He entered the United States Naval Academy when he was just 17 years old. His service as a naval aviator took him around the world and eventually to the war in Vietnam. It was there on his 23rd bombing run that John was shot down and captured. Refusing early release for the sake of his comrades, he endured five and a half years of confinement and torture. Then as now, Americans marveled at the iron will of John McCain. But captivity did not diminish John's sense of calling or his commitment to mission. As he would later say, I fell in love with my country when I was a prisoner in someone else's. And after he made it home, John traded service in the uniform of the United States for service in Congress, exchanging the rank of captain for congressman and later senator. For 35 years, John served in these very halls under this very dome. And he fought for what he believed in. In my years in Congress and as Vice President, we didn't always agree either. And he almost always noticed. But his support for limited government, for tax reform, and support for our armed forces surely left our nation more prosperous and more secure, and he will be missed. As President Trump said yesterday, we respect his service to the country. Like many of you gathered here, I also had the privilege of traveling with Senator McCain to visit our troops overseas. 
Earlier this week, I told Cindy of a time on a trip through Iraq. After another 18-hour day, when I was literally falling asleep in the middle of a dinner with Iraqi officials. After the dinner, John, who was more than 20 years older than me, walked up, put his hand on my shoulder and said, Mike, we've got a few more meetings tonight, but why don't you turn in? You look like you could use some rest. Thanks, John. Honestly, seeing him downrange, I never traveled with a colleague who was better to our enlisted or harder on our generals. John McCain loved the men and women who served in the uniform of the United States, and he was a champion of our armed forces throughout his career. In every generation, there are those who put country first, who prize service ahead of self, who summon idealism from a cynical age. John McCain was such a man. Today, he lies in the place where he served to the last, the Congress of the United States. Soon, he will go to rest on the grounds where he served first, the United States Naval Academy. The eyes of the American people will be upon him as he goes. And so too will their prayers for him, and especially for his beloved family gathered here today. And we will pray that those who mourn shall be comforted. So we mourn with those who mourn and we grieve with those who grieve, but we do not grieve like those who have no hope. Because John McCain, like millions of Americans, held firm to that hope from an old hymn that became the title of a book he wrote some 20 years ago, Faith of Our Fathers. The full stanza of that hymn